Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Do You Believe with me, Chris Allen, and we're here with a special guest, Jenny Cheerin, everybody. She uh, identifies as a, a queer person, a queer woman, and she's also a Lutheran pastor. So we are glad to have you on. Uh, Jenny, welcome, and thank you for doing the show. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, me too. So how did this uh, unfold? You're, you're, you're a pastor. Did you see this as a young child? Was this something that you always wanted? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in the church. My parents took me and my sister to church from the time we were little. And so it was always kind of a part of my life. And I actually first started feeling called to ministry, to being a pastor um, when I was in high school. And so, you know, at like the age of 16, I thought I had it all figured out. Like, right. I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to be a pastor. And that that part of it did turn out the way I expected. Um, I actually didn't come to understand myself as queer. I'm, I use the label bisexual um, until a lot later. So I actually was a pastor first. And then I was like, oh, also I'm not straight. That's interesting. <laughs> so that part kind of came later. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, so if we can back up, um, so you are a Lutheran pastor. Uh, did you grow up Lutheran or is that something that you, oh, okay, you did? Yeah. Now, um, I grew up Pentecostal. Uh, I don't uh, not do research just to be, not to be ignorant, but I like to hear what other, what people who grew up in that religion uh, has to say about it instead of what some textbook, um, you know, uh, answer may be. It, it could be right. It could be wrong, but I like to hear it from the, from the people that actually lived it and, they totally understand it. Like, so what is, how was Lutheran different than, uh, you know, Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholic or, you know, how is it different than all the other sects of Christianity? Yeah. So Lutherans are considered one of the like mainline Protestant denominations. So it's okay. similar to the Episcopal church or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church. And like, even within that, of course, there's like a lot of variety and a lot of differences. So there, there are different Lutheran denominations in the United States. Oh, really? Uh, and some of them are a lot more like theologically conservative. So some of the Lutheran denominations don't even ordain women. Like we weren't, we're not even getting to LGBT folks. They don't even ordain right. Um, the denomination that I grew up in is called the ELCA, which is Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and they mm -hmm. do ordain women. And so for me, knowing that I wanted to be a pastor, that was kind of a foregone conclusion that that that's the Lutheran denomination that I could be ordained in. Um, but even then, I would say the ELCA is kind of moderate. There are some ELCA Lutherans who are more progressive and and I think more forward thinking on like LGBTQ inclusion. And then there are some who are more conservative. Oh, wow. So I hate to be this kind of person. So you're saying basically there are there are some who are actually more Christ like than others. I mean, <laughs> when you think you're not supposed to judge anybody. That's how I look at it. Right. Am I right or wrong? I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> yeah, It's just like you should accept. But uh, yeah, I I grew up uh, Pentecostal and it was kind of the same thing. I don't remember seeing any uh, women uh, on the pulpit at all, you know, maybe leading uh, a choir or something like that. But as far as delivering a message, uh, that was something that was I would I did not see uh, growing up. I'm trying to. Yeah, I don't remember seeing that at all. Maybe the pastor's wife or maybe one of the clergy's wives would lead the congregation in a prayer. But as far as the message on the at the pulpit, I never saw that. And uh, yeah, that's I got to say, that's that's a problem. But it, it's weird because as a kid, you don't you don't think anything of it. And that's not cool. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not sure. cool. There's that that mindset of like women are not supposed to teach men. And so it's like, well, you can teach children, but like you can't actually talk to other adults in right. a religious uh, context, which is I mean, obviously, I don't agree with that. Yeah, I, I don't either. Um, so you said at 16, you knew that was your calling. Wow. That's uh that's pretty heavy for a 16 year old. Now, um, are you, are you, um, uh, are you seen as like a goody two shoes at school? Or do you stand out like, Hey, Jenny is Christian. Like, don't ask her to come to the party. She won't drink. She won't do this. Were you, were you like that at all? Or? Yeah, no, I, I think that was me when I was in high school for sure that I was, I was pretty straight laced. I was pretty like goody two shoes. Um, 
I, I was definitely not like I was not the cool kid. <laughs> not the cool kid. So it just it just took for you. It's a, your, your parents were you forced to go and then you liked it or it just kind of grew on you? Yeah, I mean, it, some sometimes I definitely felt like I was forced. Um, it, in the same way, I think that like when you're a kid, your parents force you to eat vegetables, and you're like, "This is terrible. Why are you doing this to me?" Um, but but I also I think valued it, and it was it was an important community for me, and it was a place where um, I felt affirmed, and and people were happy to see me, and people, you know. Right. So, so it felt like a good community, even though there were definitely weeks where I was like, why do I have to get up and go to church? Okay. Yeah. I, um, yeah, it was the same for us. We were, we were made to go, but I had a, I had a good time, but I don't think I ever really truly believed, uh, looking back, but it was a huge part of my life. We went multiple times a week mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I just, um, it, I, I tried, but it, it never took for me. And it took into my late twenties to realize that I, I, I wasn't a believer, but, uh, and I had a rough relationship with, uh, Christianity with the church. But as I got older, I matured. I was able to have uh, adult conversations with my mother, my parents about it. And even though I'm not religious today, my mother and I, our si my sisters and I, we can all have great discussions about, um, scriptures about, you know, just theology. It, it, I find it very, very interesting and uh, I, I enjoy the conversation. I, I enjoy the unknown. Yeah. And uh, I really applaud you at your age to really own that because that can be tough to do as a teenager with all the pressures to, you know, either have sex or smoke cigarettes, do drugs, you know, lie to your parents and all that kind of stuff. And to hold fast to that, I, that's, uh, that's very commendable. Oh, thanks. Wow. Um, so when did you start the process of like, okay, I want to do this. I want, I'm going to begin my journey to become a pastor yeah in our like in our tradition um going to seminary to get that like theological education that's a master's program so okay. i knew i had to get a bachelor's first and it was kind of like open-ended like okay i can i can do whatever major i want i can study whatever i want and then like the next step will be going to seminary. So I actually went to like a weird little liberal arts college um, and read a whole bunch of like old white guys, um, studied, uh -huh. studied some philosophy, some literature. Um, and then after I graduated from undergrad, then I went on to uh, the seminary education and I was what they call like a pipeliner. So I went straight through like high school, college, seminary. I didn't take uh, any like gaps in between. Okay. Uh, so what is, what's the seminary process like? Is that two years, four years, a year? What are we, what are we talking? <laughs> For us, it was, it was three years of classwork and one year of internship. Um, so it's, it's pretty extensive. Um, yeah, okay. You spend three years doing, you know, your theology, your history, um, learning how to preach, learning how to teach a Bible study. And then you have a year where you're in a congregation, but you have a supervisor who's already a pastor and they kind of help you learn the ropes. Okay. Now I'm very ignorant to seminary. I was in the military. I went to basic training. Uh, I, I, so is this uh, at a campus? Are you living in dorms? Is it very organized? Are you, you got to meet here at eight o'clock in the morning? You know, is it very regimented or is it really like a loose college experience it was more like a college experience um it wasn't super regimented okay. um, my husband and i did live on campus now i think there are more people who do it like remotely i mean obviously this year everything was remote but um we lived on campus and you know you'd have class you might have class at nine in the morning or there might be a day when you don't have class until after lunch so there was a little more flexibility in the schedule Okay, so it really is like more like college. I, I don't. For some reason, I always um, picture religious schools being a little bit more regimented, and for some reason, people in formations and all that kind of stuff. But again, that's just my experience of. Uh, that was my college experience. It was basic training in, in tech school. Yeah. Um, yeah. At least, uh, at least among Lutherans, I think it's usually not like that. We. Uh, I went to seminary in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Okay. And we would like walk down from the seminary um, into the kind of center of town. And Gettysburg, of course, is a touristy town. So there's lots of bars and restaurants. And we would go on Thursdays to this like local bar that sold, uh, sold us $3 pitchers of beer. 
and we would just all go and drink on a Thursday night. That's so like, it's not a boot camp kind of situation. Now, see, you mentioned drinking beer. Again, I grew up Pentecostal, and that was a huge no-no. And that would have been like a huge, like, whoa for me. So drinking, and th that's fine in, in the Lutheran uh, religion, obviously. What about like cigarette? I I'm, no, I'm asking very basic questions here. That's so okay. So smoking, smoking and all that is kind of, is that okay? Yeah. Now, do you guys preach to, uh, to like, uh, hey, you want to treat your body like a temple, maybe not do that kind of stuff, or that is a non-factor for Lutherans? You know, I would say it's it's pretty, the attitude towards that stuff is pretty casual, but I mean, certainly we would talk about like addiction right, and okay. then when those kinds of behaviors become harmful, you know, then there's, then there's a concern. But if it's, you know, you just enjoy getting, getting a beer with some friends, it's like, that's fine. Uh, Martin Luther, who gave the name to Lutheranism, um, talks about his wife brewing the best beer and oh, wow. like, he would get drunk with his students and like they'd sit up late talking about theology and drinking beer. So that's like kind of part of our tradition. That's pretty cool, actually. I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you get through seminary. Is there a big uh, ceremony when, when you're finished? Yeah. So we had graduation just like you would, you know, any any kind of academic institution. And then once you have a church where you're going to serve, then you're ordained. And the ordination is like a big, fancy oh, okay. church service. Now, how does the uh, congregation thing work out? Are you farmed out to specific churches or do you, do you get to pick? How does that work? That's one of those things that I think like every denomination does it a little differently. Okay. In the ELCA, when you graduate from seminary, you get assigned to a region of the country. So they kind of put you in a geographic area. And then you work with the bishop in that area who says, you know, this is where I want you to interview. This is what we have in mind. Uh, so when you first start out, you don't have as much say. But then like later on, so I'm now in my second call. So I got to decide when I left my first congregation that I wanted to go to another place. So I had a little more say in that. Okay. And I, I, I'm guessing as a newly ordained uh, pastor, you're probably, probably not thrown in all the way. Are you kind of just weaned in and then eventually you take over or it's just like, Hey, this is, this is your church. Here you go. No, it's it's kind of throw you in the deep end. Um, so like I said, we do that internship. That's kind of your like oh, okay. that trial makes run. Right. But no, like they, they throw you in and usually you're a solo pastor. So usually it's just you. And it's like, here's a church. Good luck. Okay. I'm going to ask you this. What does a pastor, like what are you doing during the day as a, as a pastor? Are you in the church all day making phone calls? Like what's, what's, what is a, the life, what is the day of a life of, uh, in the life of a pastor look like? Yeah. Yeah. The, the joke is like pastors only work on Sundays, right? Like we don't do anything during the right. week. Um, no. So it's, it's always a combination of things. And especially like if you are the solo pastor, you end up kind of wearing a lot of hats. So you do administrative stuff. Um, Churches have budgets, um, churches have buildings that have to be maintained. And so you end up interfacing with a lot of that stuff, um, doing pastoral care. So that might be phone calls or meeting with people or going to visit people in the hospital, uh, preparation for Sunday. So getting the service ready, um, planning your sermon, all of that kind of stuff. And so it like there's always plenty to fill up your schedule during the week. Oh, okay. Um, how do you, so for you, how do you prepare your sermons? Is it... We use, uh, it's called a lectionary. So there are like scripture readings assigned to every Sunday. Okay. And so that's kind of the starting point is like, these are the scripture readings that we're going to have on Sunday. And then you think, okay, well, what do I want to talk about? What themes am I picking up on? And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resources online now for preaching so I'll go look at commentaries online that people um, have written who like that's their job is just to be experts in the Bible and how you talk about it. So read commentaries, um, do my own kind of thinking and brainstorming. And then usually I try to come up with like a, a key theme or like this is the this is the point I want to get across. And then you sort of construct the sermon around that. 
Wow. Oh, let me ask you this one. Do you always feel uh, spoken to every week or do, do some, sometimes are you like, come on, Gina, you got to think of something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you feel like God is like, Hey, there you go. This is what we're going to talk about each week. Or do you feel, you know, sometimes you're kind of out on your own you got to scramble and find something at the last minute or has this happened? Well, you got your mindset on something and then say something happens in the news or whatever. And you yeah. go, you know what? I'm addressing this issue. Yeah. Yeah. All of the above. Oh. Uh, so some weeks it feels like, oh my gosh, like it's just flowing. It's so easy. Some weeks it feels like I'm dragging the sermon, like kicking and screaming. Um, there are some times where like I'll write a sermon and just feel like, oh my gosh, this is so mediocre. Like, It'll be fine, but it's not good. And then I'll preach that sermon and someone will come up to me afterwards and say, that's exactly what I needed to hear, which is like, <laughs> okay. I know that feeling. <laughs> somebody yeah. was, was prepared for this. Um, but yeah, stuff happening in the news is a big thing. Um, I remember one of the most memorable uh, moments for me was um, when the all the white supremacists went to Charlottesville. Yeah, my home, where I live at. <laughs> yeah, so that all happened on like a Friday, Saturday. Um, yeah. And that woman was killed uh, when the guy drove into the crowd and like literal like Nazis with torches. And and as a pastor, you're like, I can't, I can't not address this, right? Like I can't, after all of that has happened, I can't get up in the pulpit and be like, Jesus wants you to love one another. It's like, no, we got to get real. Right. So yeah, there have been some weekends where it's like Saturday night at 10 p.m. You're like, I don't know what I'm going to say about this, but I got to say something. Wow, that 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 can't be easy, you know. And it, I feel like it's such a it's a such a powerful and meaningful position. I I couldn't imagine just having to be so aware of every single word, knowing like people are clinging on to every single word. That I'm saying, you know, you can really influence people's lives and their decision making and all that. That's that's a lot to um, that's a lot to take on. That's a yeah. lot to take on. It's uh, it's definitely not something I take lightly, and especially like when I'm in the pulpit, I'm really careful that I don't say anything I'm not willing to back up. Right. Okay. People come to me afterwards and say, you know, Pastor, you're too political. Pastor, you shouldn't say this. You shouldn't bring this up. And it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna say what I can stand up for. Um, and and I do really take that seriously. Yeah. Yeah. My. Uh, yeah. I can't, I can't make it about anybody else. I. 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 Um. I agree. Um. I, I've heard a lot of people come. Um. And certain Christian sects with all the stuff that happened last year where it's, it's kind of being ignored from the pulpit. You know, I, I hate to say it. A lot of these bigger white churches just kind of like, hey, we're just going to love each other. And it's just like I, I feel like that's the wrong thing that you really need to address these specific things. If you really want to consider yourself a Christian, you have to talk about this stuff. I, I really just don't see how any person who calls himself a Christian can watch the George Floyd tape and not feel a certain way and not address that if they're a, a pastor or a preacher or a deacon or something, if you're going to get in that pulpit, you should probably mention this is it, it, it tore our country apart, you yeah. know, and people are using, they use religion all the time to justify, you know, not making cakes for people or not wanting to do this for people, or I shouldn't have to do that because I'm a Christian. And, uh, I feel like that kind of stuff sh should be addressed. I, I feel like, um, a lot of times that uh, Christianity has is being hijacked for political reasons and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty sad. And yeah. I know it has to be doubly tough for you being a woman and a queer woman. I mean, how has that impacted your uh, journey? Yeah, it's it's weird. Um, and I feel like I'm still kind of figuring it out. Um, mm -hmm. So, like I said, I became a pastor while I was still like, not just in the closet, but like, I didn't even know I was in the closet. Um, I'm married to a man. We mm -hmm. started dating when we were really young and I love him and I'm happy to be with him. And so I, I didn't go through that kind of like self-discovery that I think a lot of people do in college or in their twenties. Um, I, you know, I had my person and I'm, I love him. Uh, but I came to realize uh, kind of later on, like, I'm actually bi and 
and being bi in like a straight passing relationship is kind of weird because people will assume that I'm straight. Uh, so trying to figure out how much, how much like disclosure I make and how much of it is not people's business. But at the same time, you know, I want to be a role model and I want to say, you know, I especially think about the young people in our church and what it what it might mean to them as they're figuring out their identity to be able to say, wow, like we have a queer pastor and that's OK. And that's, you know, a part of our community. So I do feel like it's something that I want to speak about publicly, but it's I don't know. It's weird. It's a weird uh, line to walk. <laughs> So, I mean, did you have to officially come out to uh, the upper echelon clergy people sit down? Like, was that a whole process? And it if you don't mind talking about it, yeah, you don't, no, we don't I have mind. to. Okay. I don't mind. I'll tell you if you ask me something I don't want to answer. <laughs> okay. I just, I just don't want to make people to feel pressured to or yeah, overstep. Yeah. Um, there wasn't a formal process. Um, our denomination before 2009 Okay. You were not allowed to be ordained as an LGBT person. And so there were LGBT people who were serving in the church prior to 2009, but they had to really fight against the institutional like restrictions. For me, um, it was, it was more of a, a personal decision of coming out in kind of a public professional way and so I did talk to my bishop about it. I had the advantage that my bishop is an out gay man, or he was my oh, bishop, okay. not anymore. Um, he was the first openly gay bishop elected in our denomination. And so going to him and saying, hey, I think I'm going to come out to my church was not as stressful as it might have been. Um, but then, yeah, figuring out how to tell my congregation and like in what capacity I wanted to do that was tricky. And I actually had, I had a whole plan last spring. I had come out to a few people in the church here and there, but I was going to make like a public statement. So like everybody in church would know, and I was going to wait until after Easter 2020. And I don't know if you heard, but like stuff went off the rails last year. Yeah, um, I don't <laughs> It got weird, huh? Yeah. So, um, so like my plan to like ad address it to the congregation just didn't really happen the way that I intended it to. Right. Uh, and I had to kind of change, change my approach. And was it uh, well received? No, oh, yes and no. Yeah. I mean, some people, some people were excited. Some people were like, Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for being open. And and some people, I think, have a harder time with it. Wow. Yeah. Um, would you say it's made your, congregate, your congregation like a, a closer group now that you guys are – I mean, that's very honest. It's very ballsy. And, uh, I mean, I have to say for people like me, that, that – I hate to say it goes against, but I don't know what – you know what I mean? This is such a – I have never, you know, I would have, I would have never thought to ever see a, 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 a queer pastor. If you told me that when I was 12, I would go, that's not even, yeah. you know, and I, I to be honest, I 100% applaud the, uh, the inclusion, you know, we, we should, we should love everybody and everyone has something to give. So everyone has a story to tell. And just because of your sexual orientation or preference, that doesn't mean that now your your point of view or your love of Christ or God uh, or your knowledge of God is is less meaningful. Yeah. Um, did you did you struggle with that after doing all this research and stuff? Were you like, come on, like Jenny, you, you can't be gay. You're you're a pastor. Like, did you go through any of that at all, or was it fairly easy? No, I I didn't have that kind of internal struggle. Um, what I worried about was, okay, well, if I, if I come out, if I'm public about this, what are other people going to think? So I wasn't, I wasn't ever worried in the sense of like, I don't know, like God's not going to accept me if I come out. Like I didn't have that struggle, which I'm, I'm really fortunate. I mean, I consider that a, a really great thing. It was more like, okay, well, if I talk about this, I think I knew there was going to be pushback, but it's like how much pushback and what form is it going to take? And 
like I said, it's it's been a mixed bag. Some of it's been really positive, and and some has been a little more challenging. Well, okay. Um, uh, even with, with COVID, like how has that changed things for you with with COVID? Uh, and, and you know, having to sh uh, shut your church down physically. I know that that probably happened for quite a while. I mean, are you guys open now? Yeah, we're we're just about to go back in our building. So okay. I'm in Southern California now, and so we have the advantage of like good weather year round. So we've been doing services in our church parking lot, and we've been doing online worship, and we're like getting ready to go back in the building now. So I I feel like so much of the upheaval of the last year, I'm kind of still waiting to see where all the pieces settle. Um, as we kind of come back and, and see each other in person again. Um, and it's not just COVID. I mean, obviously the pandemic has been disruptive, but I mean, you mentioned George Floyd. Um, there was a, a couple of young people in uh, my town organized a Black Lives Matter March in, uh, in the summer of last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it it was interesting. There was there was some real pushback. There's some some Trumpy people um, from, from within the congregation, uh, or just some, just okay. Yeah, some from within the congregation, but also just kind of the the city more All generally. Right. So I think there's just been a lot that has been a lot has been dug up. Um, right. A lot of things have been brought out into the open that maybe we were kind of ignoring before. And I'm kind of waiting to see like, well, where do we go from here? After everything's been thrown up in the air, like what's it going to look like? Right. So, okay. Um, how, how do you feel from what you've seen? How do you feel that uh, American Christianity has handled the last year <laughs> as a, as a, as a clergy member were you disappointed overall? Like, how did you feel? I I feel like there's been so much variety. So on the one hand, you know, we've had, there's a, a church not far from where I live that never closed. They just refused to obey the public health orders. And right. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, it's so frustrating to see people, um, you know, willfully endangering lives. Um and claiming that it's religious freedom. Um, and, and of course, you know, talking about the police brutality and racism, uh, I think a lot of white churches and a lot of white denominations, including my own, um, have been way too silent or have kind of tried to, you know, please both sides and, and that's disappointing. Uh, but I will say, you know, I look at, I look at colleagues, um, I'm connected to a lot of um, pastors through um, just, you know, social media right. and folks have been doing really hard work all year um, in terms of keeping people safe, responding to the pandemic, uh, you know, trying to, to have these health measures in communities that were very resistant. Um, trying to have important conversations about racism and, you know, other forms of discrimination. So I think there's, there's hopeful things too. I think there are churches that are really, um, you know, in the trenches trying to do important work. Um, and then there are some where I think, you know, it's, uh, there's kind of this marriage of the religious right, where I think some churches uh, kind of abdicated the core of their faith in order to have political influence. And I, I 100% agree. Now, were there just, were there just, it, it is, were there discussions like in these, in these groups of pastors and stuff? Now, is this being discussed? Are people, well, are you having people like, hey, you gotta, you know, uh, you guys gotta vote Trump? And, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, we're pro life. We gotta, we gotta do this kind of thing where it was that kind of stuff going on. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, I saw a lot of it among clergy in terms of like, how do I talk to my congregation about this? Mm -hmm. How do I encourage my congregation to obey the health orders? How do I, you know, in a predominantly white church, how do I um, talk about police brutality? Uh, so it was a lot of kind of struggling and, and collaborating to figure out how we, how we address those things. Um, right. And then also just a lot of uh, like venting because you 
you really do your best, you know, day in, day out. And then sometimes you just have to go to, to some friends and complain about <laughs> how much, right. how much nonsense you're dealing with. Yeah. So I was going to ask you that. How do you deal with, how do you deal with someone like that in your congregation where they're just so just almost willfully ignorant? And it's just like, I have to like, how do you deal with sheep? No, I don't know. I don't mean like in a political sense sheep, but like, how do you deal with people in your flock who are just resistant to seeing what's going on? Do they, I guess they would probably eventually leave if they didn't like it that, that much, but that has to be tough as a, as a person in your, in your position to have to listen to, to this and, you know, almost correct people, you know, yeah, it's tricky. Um, it, and it's an ongoing challenge to figure out, you know, I'm, I'm in a relationship with these people. I am their pastor, whether I'm happy with what they're doing or not. Right. Uh, and, and you can't, most of the time you can't just burn those bridges and say, you're wrong and I don't want to talk to you anymore. So it's like, how do you continue the conversation and how do you bring people along um, and, and maybe help to move the needle a little bit. Uh, but it's really slow. People see church as kind of a, a refuge where they're not going to be challenged and they're not going to be criticized. And so it can be, it can be hard as a pastor to say, I love you. More importantly, God loves you, but also like you need to change your behavior. Um, it's a tricky line to walk. It, it has to be. It, it, it really does. I mean, uh, just just hearing stories from, from from some people, just the things that are that are being said in some of these churches, it's just outright just it's it's mind blowing. You know, the the fact that you just have people who just they they can't see that this is a problem, and religion is supposed to bring people together. You know what I mean? It's supposed to, we're supposed to drop all the other extra BS and go, Hey, we're all God's children. We're all made in his, in his image and we should all love each other. But it, it's, it's gotten so political now that uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's turning off a lot of people from Christianity because it, it's just, it comes with this, this connotation of like, Hey, you gotta be right wing. You gotta be pro gun. You gotta, you can't like these group of people. You gotta do this. I mean, how, how do you fight that? Yeah. And, and it's so real. I think especially, you know, I have a lot of friends who um, are not religious, uh, some of whom have really been hurt by the church. And, yeah. and I don't want to discount that, right? right? I don't want to say, you know, it's, it's so dismissive to say, well, I'm not that kind of Christian, right? It's like, that's not the point. So, uh, you know, the best that, that I can do is try to live live out my faith and be a model of that authentically and you know I'll have friends who say I'm not religious like I'm never going to belong to a church but I appreciate what you have to say and appreciate you know seeing a different kind of presentation of Christianity and I think that's that's really the best we can do the Christianity has earned its bad reputation um and wow. not just not just in the last four years, but like for hundreds of years. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to fault anybody. I'm not going to fault any, you know, any queer kids who have just signed off of religion because religion told them they weren't worthy. It's like, no, we gotta, we have to clean our own mess before right. we expect people to accept. Right. So how, why is that hard for certain people to admit that the church has done some things that, that, you know, that they've, we've heard a lot of people. I mean, we, we're not even, we're talking about Protestants. I mean, look at the Catholic church. Look, look at that whole mess with the molestation and stuff. Why is it so hard for people to admit that, Hey, we've made a lot of mistakes in the religious realm as a country. Like, why is that so tough? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, people feel like that's a part of their identity that's being attacked. And I, I see the same kind of defensiveness as when, you know, you talk to white people about racism and they're like, well, I never owned slaves, right? Like right. I'm not responsible. And I think it's the same kind of attitude. Like, well, I never did these terrible things. And it's like, yeah, but you're part of a system. You're part of an institution that did those things. Right. 
And so like, you can't ignore that. You can't erase that. You have to be honest about it and then try to be better. But I think people feel real defensive um, because they think you're saying, well, you're a bad person. Very true. Because I I, used, I work with uh, quite a few Catholics uh, in my in my day, and whenever you would bring up the whole scandal of the priest and stuff, and they they would get very very defensive, and it's just like, hey man, I'm not trying to say you're a bad Catholic, but there's just a lot of stuff that's gone on that's been swept under the rug, and it, I can't be on because I I used to have friends trying to convert me to Catholicism, and I'm like I can't this molestation stuff I I can't, and they would just roll their eyes. And these are the same people. They're also very conservative, very, you know, right wing, and they ha hate pedophiles so much. But I'm like, why do these priests get a pass? Like, why? Wh why are these guys different than any anybody else? And no one really wants to answer answer that question. You know, people get so bent out of shape about it, and uh, I, I just don't think we can get anywhere unless we really talk about it and, and, and clean it up. You know? Yeah. Man, um, so let me ask you this. I'm asking a lot of questions here. Um, <laughs> what's been your biggest challenge as a queer pastor? Is it the, the other other clergy, people from outside influences? Biggest challenge. Um, I, I feel like the biggest challenge, and this is especially in the last like year and a half, just because things have been so off the rails. Um, sometimes I feel like, uh, okay, this is going to be a nerdy reference. I hope you don't mind, but I love uh, nerdy in the, in the Spider-Man movie where the, the boat gets like cut in half and Spider-Man is like trying to hold the two halves together. Right. Um, sometimes I feel like that. Like, <laughs> Like yeah, I'm trying yeah. to hold a congregation together and keep them talking to each other when everybody is so divided and there's so much animosity and there's so much mistrust. And we're trying to do all of that on Zoom. So it's like, that's been the hard thing, especially lately. Okay. Yeah. That, it's good to know that there's no specific, there's no thing specifically that, uh, that is hard for you for being a queer person, which makes me feel good that uh, no one's really holding that against you and they can, they can get past that and listen to what you, what you have to say. I, I feel like California will probably be a great state to be a, um, you know, a, a queer pastor. And I think it's a lot more accepted. Um, here's a weird question. What's the church's ruling on marijuana out there? Since it's so legal. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, no. that's kind of left field, but Hey, I would like yeah, to know. That's cool. I like it. I like it. I haven't heard anything like formally. Um, what about Pastor Korean? It, if it's okay, so I'm in California. It's legal. I think if you want to do it, it's fine. Not personally for me, um, but I I think like I kind of want the bigger conversation to be about like, well, are we going to decriminalize on the federal level, and then are we going to actually talk about all the people that got incarcerated in the war? Right. Yes. So like, if you want to smoke pot, like cool, but let's talk about like these, what to me seem like the bigger issues, the social justice aspect of it. Cause it, it really is kind of, it, it's disheartening to see uh, all these guys uh, making millions of dollars now. And you have uh, uh, so many black men in jail for, I mean, joints, you know, an ounce it, just in jail for years. They have stuff on their records. They can't, you know, get certain certifications. They can't get certain jobs. They can't have certain housing all over this marijuana. But here you have these same kind of guy, this, these guys making millions of dollars off of it. Um, there was, um, I can't think of his name now, but he used to be the majority speaker. Um, he was a Republican guy, never really was for weed, but he got out of government and now he's big into it. And it's just like, you spent your whole career railing against it. You, you see the writing on the wall. You see there's going to be a lot of money to be made. You jump ship, and now you're one of the biggest players in the marijuana game. You know, it's it's crazy, and it's very unfair. Yep. I, I'm, I'm glad that the uh, social uh, social justice aspect would, would be uh, um, addressed. Um, what, would you, what would you say to a young person who was like, hey, I, I think I want to do this? Would you discourage them, dissuade them? 
ask them to pray about it? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think I would probably preach caution. Um, in the same way, if I was talking to a young person about alcohol um, or about being sexually active, like I don't think any of those things are bad in and of themselves. Right. But I do think that, you know, if you're 17, 18, you may not have like the full brain development to understand the potential consequences. And so, you know, just making sure that you're thinking things through and you're being careful and you're being responsible. Um, yeah. And of course, like if it was somebody in my church, that would, that would be a conversation that we'd probably want to have like with family. Um, just to talk about like, Hey, how are we, how are we, caring for kids and, and youth in our community in a way that's going to be, you know, for their, their best uh, outcomes. Okay. Um, how, now, how long have you been a pastor? I've been a pastor since 2012. Okay. So now, has it, has it changed a lot, uh, you know, um, as far as like uh, just the attitude of, of younger pastors, the passing of the torch from the old generation to the new generation, have you seen a lot of, have you seen a lot of change? Yeah, there has been some of that. I think probably like not more so than any other part of society. Okay. Uh, I know even when I was like in college, they were saying there's going to be this uh, clergy shortage. All these older clergy are going to retire and there aren't going to be enough pastors. And then the economic crash happened and all these pastors said, I can't afford to retire. So they all stayed. And then we keep saying there's going to be this clergy shortage. There's going to be this clergy shortage, but uh, kind of hasn't materialized. And, you know, if you look at uh, if you look at the, the data, big picture, the people who aren't getting called, you know, the, the graduating seminarians or the pastors that are looking for calls, um, the people who wait the longest are women of color, queer people. Like, I mean, just exactly what you would expect that um, the folks that are typically marginalized are still marginalized in the church. So I, I, I think all of that has been going on. Like that's not a new trend. I do feel like, um, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of things have been brought to light. Mm -hmm. um, stuff that maybe wasn't as visible or wasn't being talked about as much uh, has come to the forefront. So there's more open conversation about this stuff, even though it was going on before. Okay. Now, are there any organizations within the, uh, the, the um, clergy body that like, Hey, we're all LGBT pastors or like pastors of color. Are there like organizations where they want to talk to the, maybe the more uh, the higher ups and go, Hey, we need more women of color. How can we make this happen? Like are those discussions being had? At, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there are a number of those kind of affinity organizations. So mm -hmm. uh, in our denomination, there's a group called Proclaim, and Proclaim is specifically for out LGBTQ clergy. And they're connected to um, an organization called Reconciling Works. And what Reconciling Works does is advocate for full inclusion of LGBTQ people in the church. So there's a lot of organizing that goes on there in terms of you know, not just justice for queer clergy, but also how are we working for inclusion of LGBTQ people more broadly in the church? Okay. Because there are still there are still churches and places where they are very much not welcome. Uh, that stinks, and it's it's church. <laughs> Everyone is welcome. Yeah, um, I'm not trying to put you on a spot here. But uh, do you have an opinion on all gay churches? Do you feel like uh, that should be a thing? Or and if you don't want to answer, I get it. I just... No, I, I think it's a good question. And I, I can definitely see the, the value of it. So some of my friends actually are uh, featured in a documentary that's coming out this year about queer church. And I, it was... Uh, maybe 2019 during Pride Month. Um, they they did queer church where it was a church service in a church building down in Santa Monica, I think. Mm -hmm. And they had drag queens and they had 
queer um, clergy leading the service. And it was, it was everything that is that kind of joyful celebration that goes along with pride. And I think that that can be so, so powerful and right. so liberating, um, especially for individuals who feel like they have to kind of turn the volume down on who they are in most right. cases to just say, I'm going to be unabashedly myself. I think that can be so powerful. Um, That's awesome. If it were like a, an all LGBT community, yeah, there, there are congregations that are kind of founded on that principle. I know a community in LA that is specifically an outreach to um, LGBTQ people of color. And right. you know, I think straight people are allowed to go there, but that's not their mission. Like that's not their focus. Right. Right. I I I, I love, I love hearing this stuff because, because it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't get, get talked talk about. about. All the all the jerks get mentioned on the news. You know, we always hear about, oh, I don't want to make a cake. I don't want to do this. You know, you know, just people with their Bible and their AR-15. And I'm a gun guy. I'm a retired military guy. But it's just like, I just don't think this is what Jesus wants us to be doing. You know, it's just like this. Some of the stuff is just outrageous that they're doing. And it's, it's it, I really feel feels like it makes a mockery of what Jesus is, what he stood for, what the church stands for. And it, I'm not even a Christian anymore. And it bothers me so much to see the religion hijacked by just jerks, you know, for, like you said, for political gain. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, it really bothers me. It, it, it does. Yeah. Um, I agree. It does. Um, I know we talked about that. We, we kind of got off, off uh, topic, but um, you mentioned you guys were doing stuff outside. You were doing Zoom. Um, I also do comedy, and I with the what 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 the what COVID and the in and, and uh, the pandemic did for me, and I think a lot of comics we realize that comedy isn't as fragile as we thought it was like, it's got to have low ceilings. We can't have, we can't do it, do it during the day. You can't do it outside. But we learn, oh no, people get used to this. You can do it outside. You can do it during the day. You, you know what I mean? We learn all this stuff. Um, have you guys, has your church implemented anything uh, that you think you're going to continue to do throughout uh, from here on out that was implemented during COVID? Maybe, you know, streaming the services or... Yeah, it's been really interesting. So we we are planning to have an online stream just from now on. Awesome. Um, so even when we go back in the building and we're starting out at like limited capacity, but even when we're at full capacity, we're just going to keep doing that because what we've learned is, uh, you know, it's more inclusive for people who have disabilities, right, who maybe can't get to the physical church service. Um, we had people who, you know, would travel to visit family and then they'd be attending church. Um, you know, I had church members who were zooming into a book study from Nebraska because oh, wow. of the road trip. And, you know, we kind of realized like, wow, there are these possibilities that we never considered before. For me, I think it's really, um, it's helped me to focus on priorities. Mm -hmm. I think there's kind of this inertia where you just keep doing things the way you've always been doing it. Going COVID through all of that out the window. Right. And so now I think we're able to really talk about, well, what's essential to being a church? Like what are the really essential pieces? And exactly. it turns out a lot of what we were doing wasn't essential. And it turns out we found new things that are actually more exciting and life giving and we never would have tried them before. So that's kind of neat. That's very, very true. Uh, I, I, we, we have gotten comfortable in, in our ways. We realize, I would say before the pandemic, whenever you would mention telework, everyone would kind of go, mm, I think you just want to sit at home and watch TV. <laughs> it's just like Americans, we're so skeptical of each other. We always feel like someone's trying to get over or you don't want to work. But we realize like, oh, you really don't have to go into the office every single day to get your job done. Most people are responsible. They get their, they can get their work done at home. And you realize too, like, oh, I'm at work for eight hours, but I'm really only doing three hours worth of work. You know, we, we find busy work to do. And I think the pandemic did shed. We did shed a lot of extra things 
that we don't need. And unfortunately, there were some there are some people who who jobs may have fell into that. But now we just got to we our society needs to continue to pivot and find other meaningful work for those people to do. You know, we I don't I'm not saying they're not needed in our society, but maybe that thing they that thing they did before probably not needed. And we probably knew that before, but we have this this thing of like we need we need everyone to feel uh, like they're um, part of a society, which I agree with. But there's a lot of stuff that's outdated that's stuck around for years because we're so reluctant to change. We're so afraid of things changing. And I think COVID, uh, we saw like, hey, we don't need all this stuff, man. We we can we can kind of scale it back and find other things for for people to do. And like you said, prioritizing. You know, for me as a comic, I don't now that things are opening back up, I'm, I value my time more and I'm less inclined to maybe drive two and a half hours to do uh, five or 10 minutes on a show that really isn't that significant. And it's not going to move my career yeah. uh, further. It's like I would rather stay at home with my wife and son and uh, just stay at home, you know, and, and spend quality time with them. Yeah. And um, yeah. Man, I. uh I got a couple more questions. We can get out of here. I'm I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. I don't want to ask the wrong question. I'm always no, nervous totally around good. clergy. We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, what is what? What do you love the most about being a pastor? I I love the moments where where I feel like my gifts are like meeting a need or or something and things just kind of click. Uh, so I love teaching. That's one of the things that I really enjoy doing. And as a pastor, I get to do a lot of teaching, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And when I have those moments, uh, you know, with our like middle schoolers where I'm talking to them about some Bible concept and like they're probably like 80% bored, but like, when things really click and they get excited, then yeah. it's like, man, fireworks going off. Like it's the greatest feeling. Um, or when you're able to meet, meet with somebody who's in, you know, a really difficult position, um, losing a loved one or facing end of life decisions or to be able to be present. It's, it's really heavy, but it feels really satisfying to know I was able to be there and meet that need in that moment um, feels really gratifying. That's something I've never really thought about. Like preachers and and, and pastors and clergy, they give people depending on what you know their last rites. A lot of times you're holding people's hand or right there when they're taking their their last breaths, and that that's that has to be a heavy heavy thing. Yeah, yeah, it's heavy, but it it feels so worth it. There are sometimes things you have to deal with in church that just feel stupid, that just feel like this is a waste of everybody's energy, but right. not those things. Like those things feel like it's worth the investment. Man. Oh, and then my last question, uh, I probably should have been the second to last question, but we, we, we're on a, in on a high note. Um, as a clergy, what do you do when you struggle with your faith? How does Jenny get out of her out of her low points as you know as a clergy member? Yeah, we, I know we all go through it. Yeah, that's that is a great question, and and I love that you asked it because I think sometimes people think like, oh, like the pastor never has doubts, the pastor never has struggles. Like, not true. You're not human, uh, yeah. And and I'm somebody who like lives with depression, and so oh wow, interesting. Those like when it gets low it's really low. Um, so, you know, the things that help are the kind of, uh, you know, best practices that you would probably recommend to anyone. Like I'm in therapy. I take antidepressants, like these things help to keep me regulated. Um, and, and then just having, having people in places where I can be honest about whatever I'm struggling with and knowing that that is not a failing or, you know, not a, a sign that I'm a bad pastor or a bad Christian. Um, and I, I love to highlight that even in, even in scripture, you see those same themes of people doubting, 
people struggling, people. Noting Thomas, uh, yeah. And yeah. And, and it's in our Bible. So right. like, of course it's okay. And, and I sometimes have to remind myself of that. Um, I especially really love um, the book of Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Bible, um, which is just a guy like looking at the world and saying, this is bullshit. Like everything is terrible. And sometimes I really relate to that. Like, yeah, exactly. We all can. Yeah. We all get that way. Yeah. This has been, I mean, I, like I, I grew up Pentecostal. It was very Southern style. And to see a, uh, a, a woman pastor, you have tattoos, you got a cool haircut, you know, you, <laughs> In my church, shoulders out was a no no. I mean, I was old school. Like some women would come in dressed, their dress was a little too tight, and the old mothers would come and put a put a shawl on them. They would throw a uh, a, a towel on their lap. I mean, to see how much it's changed, and it's not as um what my sisters like to call it. They like to say it's not as um religious or religified. It's not as um just like this so stuck in like the, almost the literal. Trans, just taking every word literally, you know, and there's there is just no room for interpretation, you know, just no tolerance on either side for anything. And uh, it was a lot of fire and brimstone. But talking to people like you and other people, I it makes me think that maybe one day I will come back. I, I feel like it, it's changing. And people like you in the position that you're in, we need for more people like you. On TV, speaking out because I'm honestly I'm sick of watching these assholes on TV claiming to be pr Christian because they don't want to make a gay cake or they don't want a trans person eating pizza at their shop. It's like, what the hell are we doing? Like, yeah. do you think Jesus would really turn these people away? You think he wouldn't serve these people? You, if anything, he would be immersed in their community. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm hundred percent agree. It, 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 yeah. And just seeing, hearing your story, I hope everything works out for you. Um, I, I, I hope that, you know, that uh, anyone that you come across that's, that's struggling with their faith, their sexuality, that you can help them out. I, I just, I, I hope the best for you. Like, so what's your end goal? Do you want to be somebody high up? Like, wh what are you shooting for? Uh, it, no, right now I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, this, this church that I'm in, it's a good fit. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm where I need to be, uh, which doesn't mean it's easy. Sometimes That's it's really hard, feeling. but, but I feel like we're doing good work and, and I'm happy with that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. Uh, sorry if I was a little nervous. Uh, I'm always nervous speaking to pastors. I don't, I'd never want to offend. I don't want I don't want uh, I don't want the big man getting any word from uh, clergy that uh, pissed them off and I get a flat tire or something like that. So no, no fire and brimstone coming. Nope. from me. None. Good. I hated that stuff growing up. I'm glad this. I've noticed that, too. Uh, a lot of people I'm talking to, they're, they're, they're saying that a lot of churches are moving away from that. It's about love and acceptance. It's not about what you can't do, what you need to be doing to get into heaven, because that's how I grew up. And it really turned me off. And it honestly, it made me terrified of God. It made me terrified of church. It made me terrified of making mistakes to the point where like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with this because obviously I'm never going to live up to all these expectations. And it, it really turned me off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You and a lot of people. Yeah. It, it's yeah, that. And that's why I like to do this, to hear about uh, the different, um, the different to hear people's different stories and, 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 and backgrounds and hear and hearing about uh, how they came up. And it's just, it's, it's sad to hear that so many people have had the same horrific uh, experiences, but there's a lot of people have great. And the point of this podcast is not to bash religion, but just to hear people's different points of view, view and uh, the history and how it's made their life better. And, and, and uh, unfortunately in some cases, how it's uh, in, impacted them, uh, negatively. And I think we should really work on trying to fix those people's religious trauma, yeah. you know? So, well, thanks for, uh, for coming on. Where can people find you, uh, you know, online? Can people watch your sermon online anywhere? Yeah. Um, yeah, all our, uh, pandemic worship services are on YouTube. Um, so it's youtube.com slash C slash S V L C see me. 
I can send you the links. Yeah, can you send me the link? I'll put it in the description so people can check in and uh, like and subscribe and watch the sermon and uh, support your, yes, your congregation. Right button, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. You got. Thank you have you a great so weekend. Or have a great week. And again, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me about uh, your religious journey and what you're going through. Thank you so much. I'll Thanks. see you later. Bye bye. Thanks.